Greetings, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Vancouver Real. I'm your co-host today, Mike Zaremba. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be with you. And always joining me is my brother, Andy. Hello, everybody. This is actually a very special day at uh, Float House and Vancouver Real. This is our four, fourth birthday for Float House, actually. So we've been in business for four years, and uh, it has been quite an epic ride, and it's had ups and downs, and that typically is the way of the entrepreneurial venture. And uh, it lets that less doing cool things like Vancouver Real and having all sorts of amazing and interesting conversations with really cool people like we're going to do in just a few minutes. Yeah, and uh, well, happy birthday to you, Float House birthday. Yeah. I remember four years ago today um, when I opened up the shop and just how incredible that day was having the first floater come in and then the second floater being our mom which was really sweet and then, um, it's awesome you it, was, support. it was a special special well, day man well for me it was like <clears throat> it was such a gratifying day as well because uh we had to blast through quite a lot of resistance to get this place opened and it was so new and novel at that time that people really didn't even know what floating was right um so we had a lot of friends that would be like they were almost a little condescending like hey how's the float thing coming along mm -hmm. like pretty good you know and you know we'd literally walk down the street and there'd be like one out of 20 people might know what floating is um, however, now that's definitely changed. Almost everybody knows what it is. And uh, I remember making a post and I posted our schedule, which was basically empty at the beginning of the day. And then I posted it three hours later and the schedule was completely full. And I was just like, there you go. So I was like, yes, we were right about floating, which <laughs> is super awesome. validating. Yeah. So um, if you haven't come in and tried floating yet, you can use the promo code Vancouver Real. That will get you a 20% discount on a single float. You can go book that through floathouse.ca. Yep, and uh, we want to give a shout out to the Vancouver Real community. Uh, we do live events now. If you want to participate with these community events that we do all the time, uh, the next one being Wim Hof on May 21st is an affiliated event. Uh, we have a meditation event coming up later in the month. Check out our VancouverReal.tv website and go to the uh, uh, events page, and you can see all the events we have coming down the pipe. And also the Facebook group page for Vancouver Real Community is a great hub as well. You get to see instant access. And if you are on the website, join the mailing list because you actually get first exclusive um, uh, invites to these different free events that we have going on as well. Yeah. And we also have one coming up really quickly. It's going to be with Philip McKernan. He's going to be doing another live podcast this week uh, on Thursday at 4 p.m. And uh, he'll be coming into town to do a screening of his new documentary, Give and Grow. And he'll also be doing a live Q&A. And if you guys know anything about Philip, you know that's going to be definitely a bit you know, soul-wrenching, for lack of a better way of saying it. Like, he cuts through the bullshit of your life, and he really just gets down to it. And he's, huge, he's a huge advocate of just you know, being your authentic self and having the bravery to be who you really are. And that can be a little bit scary, but Philip's amazing at drawing that out in people. And then on May 20th, we actually have Mindful Mass, and we're going to be doing our Mindful Mass meditation at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Uh, the, again, the tickets are up on Eventbrite. Uh, you can go to our Mindful Mass Facebook group page, and you can register and get tickets for that. And it's free, of course, along with the Vancouver Real Meetups, but not Wim Hof. No, Wim Hof is a special event. Yeah. So cool. um, that's the Vancouver Real community, and also a big shout out to Omen Pacman for helping us out behind the scenes and making it possible for us to be on Facebook Live. And uh, again, thanks to uh, London Real and London Real Academy and Brian Rose for the inspiration. Totally. That's Any it. Anything else? We're good. We're, okay. we're ready. Well, today's guest is one that actually I had never met until just this moment. I saw him on Facebook doing a Facebook Live, and I'm like, wow, this guy is really resonating. He, he was talking about the entire financial system and how it all breaks down and how it all works. And you know, I've been inspired by watching different online videos like – well, you know, the Zeitgeist movie that talks about like the fractional reserve banking system and things like that. And when you watch movies like that or documentaries online, you're not really sure if it's true or not. And then the gentleman today, Thomas DeShooter, actually was explaining the exact same phenomenon. I was like, wow, I need to have this guy in the podcast. And so as I said, our guest today is Thomas DeShooter, and this is his book, Bloom, your money, your life, and he also is like, um, I guess, a financial planner in a sense, right? To help people build financial wealth and, yeah. and literacy within their lives so they can basically have the freedom that they want within their life. So without further ado, Thomas the Shooter, welcome Great. to Vancouver Real. Thank you so much, guys. That was like such an amazing intro. Just watching you two jam it out was fantastic. I loved it. Thank you. Uh, the comment on your mom 
Beautiful. My very first client when I started, you know, in uh, 2001 with Edward Jones, my very first client was my mom. So I can resonate with that. That was like a, yeah. you know, a great gift that my mom was like, here, I'll give you all of my money. You know yeah. nothing, but here you go. Right? It always feels good when you, put, you, you do a, a post on Facebook and your mom always likes it. You yes. know, it's just like, thanks, mom. You know, well, back, back when I played music, my mom used to come out to my shows. Right. And no matter how loud and obnoxious the band was, my mom would just sit there doing the. Yeah, little, totally. Little, little mom clap. It totally. Was, it was beautiful. Uh, yeah, yeah. Our, ours was super dedicated as a mother. Uh, I mean, like, she went to multiple, multiple sporting events throughout our entire childhood. Um, when I was playing football in the States, she actually used to drive six hours down to just watch our games. Yeah. And I wasn't even playing at the time. I was on the bench at the very beginning anyways. So, like, she'd be out in the cold, like, filming my games, like, making highlight <laughs> tapes so I could send out to different schools and things like that. So, yeah, it's great to have support of mothers for sure. Yeah. But, um... One thing I wanted to start off today is maybe you could tell people uh, that are listening, what, uh, what's your background and how did you okay. become an expert on financial literacy? Uh, great. Yeah. So, you know, it was really The Wealthy Barber. I read The Wealthy Barber mm -hmm. back in uh, 1998. And at that point, I was struggling for what I was going to do with the next phase of my life. I read that and I just got completely turned on the fact that, you know, that, that money... You could make money while you slept. And that to me was foreign. I was a musician prior to then. I didn't even know what an RSP was or what a stock was, how any of that stuff worked. I read The Wealthy Barber and really literally all of my passion that I had that was, had dwindled out of my musical career just caught fire. And I, I could not stop reading and getting information on the financial system. Um, and from there, I decided I wanted to uh, be an investment advisor. I applied to Edward Jones. Uh, I had a good career at Edward Jones. I eventually got offered a buyout deal by Scotia McLeod. I moved my practice to Scotia McLeod, and then uh, it lasted about 14 months till I realized that it just was not my place. It right. wasn't for me. And so I went off on my own and just start, just started, or started uh, DeShooter Financial, a big stretch, took my last name and put financial behind it. <laughs> awesome. Um, and then uh, have spent really since the, the final, so that was in 2008, right at the time that I went off on my own, we had the 2008 financial crisis. And I learned a lot, obviously, but it really shaped where I am today because I looked at it and went, if, you know, I've been through this twice now, they got the 2000, you know, NASDAQ wreck. Uh, where technology stocks were hugely overvalued and then a whole bunch of money was lost. And then we built up client accounts to 2008 where, again, we have another crisis and a whole bunch of money is lost. And I really thought, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing three times and mm. expecting a different result. Yeah. And so my business partner, Ryan Whitmire, and I just decided, you know, we're miss what are we missing, actually, was the question, was what are we missing? Why are we doing what we always did? We need to find a different thing. And so we just put that, you know, for lack of a better term, we just put that under the universe. Yeah. We're looking for something else that makes sense to us. And um, lo and behold, somebody showed up on our door and gave us a book in 2013 called Becoming Your Own Banker. Hmm. And that completely turned everything I thought I knew about the financial system on its head. And it it forced Ryan and I into a really uh, a deeper quest into how money works, which then, you know, we learned about the Federal Reserve, how the Federal Reserve was formulated, how it works, how the U.S. government borrows money from the Federal Reserve, how fiat currency became into being, uh, you know, the gold yeah. standard being stripped away. Well, these are things I totally love to dive into today. Now, yep. financial literacy is one thing that is not really taught too much in, in schools, especially in high schools. And it's such an important one. I mean, how many kids out of high school end up piling up a ton of debt on credit cards, student loans, car loans, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Um, and they just dig themselves a hole like, right from the get-go, right? And we're not really taught on how to manage our money correctly and how to make money in society, which is really interesting. We know we had this education system that set up that was a good job in teaching us the fundamentals, but you know, money and money management is critical to living a good life in this society that we live in. So maybe we can go back um, just to give people who have no idea about how the financial system as a whole works. Could you go back to uh, maybe the inception of like the Federal Reserve, how that came to be, and um, everything that goes along with that. Okay, sure. And I'll give a really a 30,000 foot view so we're not too in depth and I'll, I'll keep as much jargon out of it as possible. And just sure. one quick thing. 
uh, technical th- stuff here, folks. Um, with your hands on the table, just watch. You don't shake the cameras too much. Ooh, got it. That's all good. That okay. way we got a nice steady stream. But, but, yeah. but I was a drummer. I can't. I, I can't. know. Well, <laughs> the rhythm's your <laughs> <are> instinct, right? <laughs> <laughs> <Don't>. um, <laughs> Perfect. So, yeah, going back to 1913, the Federal Reserve was created, and it was sold to the American people as if it was a federal institution, in other words, owned by the government, but it's actually not. It's a private cartel that is owned by bankers and individuals, and their purpose is to print money and lend it to the U.S. government, which then puts it into circulation, if you will, to the people. Right. right? So... You have this entity that is a separate from all government responsibility and is its sole purpose is to create debt. The only way it gets paid is to create debt. So if we want to fast forward, for the longest time, the U.S. dollar was pegged to gold, meaning that one dollar of value bought you one dollar of gold. And you could exchange, not, not individuals, but the other central banks around the world could exchange U.S. dollars for gold, Mm -hmm. right? So they would take their... So just imagine that... The gold standard. Yeah, just imagine um, a a company goes to a company in France and buys a bunch of goods they pay in U.S. dollars. The company in France has the option to, you know, put that in the bank there. They do. It runs its circulation. Now, the, the... country of France can hold on to those U.S. dollars or they can exchange them back for gold and take possession of gold, right? That's how it worked. 1971, Nixon realized that France had sort of called the U.S.'s bluff and said, we don't think you actually have all of the gold that your dollars represent. So we want to cash in every dollar we have for gold. France said this. Yes. It, that, that was, they started this sort of concept that maybe the U.S. didn't have all of the gold that they were claiming they had. Nixon came out in a public address and said, from this day forward, we will no longer exchange dollars for gold and now we are on a fiat currency a fiat currency meaning it, meaning it's not backed by any hard asset it is just worth the value of the government or what society will actually put on its value i mean if everybody decided that the u.s dollar was worthless it would be worthless but yeah. right now everybody thinks that it's the reserve currency and so it has the status it has right it's got a quick question on that yeah um did France ever get their gold then? So I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I read sort of these articles on what was going on as to what happened with actual delivery. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to speculate, but they cool. sort of started this transition of calling the bluff that we don't think the U S has all of the gold for the amount of dollars they have in circulation. Right. Right. And so now we have fiat currency, which means that literally they can just print money out of thin air. They don't have to be responsible for having a hard asset to back up the goal or to back up the paper money. So if you're a politician and you are running for office, are you going to stand there and say, hey, vote for me. I think we need to knuckle down. We need to raise some taxes and we need to pay off debt because we're running too far into debt and it's not going to be a good thing long term Mm -hmm. versus the guy standing next to you that's going, hey, don't worry about it. I'm going to create jobs and we're going to bring in more revenue and we're not going to raise taxes and we'll give you all of the benefits that you want. Who are you going to vote for? The guy who's painting the pretty picture. Right. The guy who's painting the pretty picture. Mm -hmm. So now we have massive amounts of government debt around the world. And if you looked at it in an honest way, every country is pretty much bankrupt. They're all running deficits. Now, I don't know if you even know the answer to this question. So the Federal Reserve is a private banking institution, right? It's it's a cartel, really. It's a cartel. Now, then who owns it? Like who who is involved with owning that? Banks and individuals, and it's really hard to get the names of who are the profiteers, if you will, from the from the Federal Reserve itself. Right. And this is where you start getting into like conspiracy theory, Alex Jones territory almost, you know? Yes. Um, but the funny thing is there there is wiggle room for that wet line of thinking because of the secrecy around it. Yes. Like we yeah. don't really know who these people are, I'm guessing. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, if you are controlling the money supply, you're controlling that population pretty hard. Especially we can turn on and talk, uh, turn on and turn off the taps whenever you want. It seems like. Well, not only that, but as soon as you have somebody indebted, how much control do you have over them? Total. Yes, like the the money is the access point to put pressure on the common citizen, right? So, you know, I, I have a joke that I do sometimes in uh, when I give presentations. Is you know that class in high school where they taught you everything you needed to know about money and mortgages and debt and how credit cards work? Do you remember that class? I was sick that day. How about you know? How about anybody else in the room? It's not taught, and yeah. 
you know, I could go down the road of conspiracy theory that it's not taught for a certain reason. Right. I don't really want to do that because I'd much rather live in an empowered conversation around money. Totally. Yeah. But it does shock me that the one key, the most key tool you are ever going to use and need when graduating from high school is not taught. Yes. That kind of makes me go, why is that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are, uh, you know, it's very hard. We have this conversation frequently, like how would you function outside of normal society without money? And it's pretty tough. I don't know, living off the grid, maybe you could create some kind of sustainable uh, house. And some people do that, actually. But um, it's, it's pretty tough to, to disconnect, especially when you start throwing in there, uh, like, you know, family and children and things like that. And you want to still have access to health care and all the, the nice things that civilization provides right so yeah. um okay so we have a kind of zoomed out perspective of yeah. the financial system and what's going on there now knowing that and knowing the way this this game is being played out yeah what can people do about that like what can they do to start um taking control of their life and their finances great question so obviously education is critical um they could read my book, of course, because I did, I did write it with the I, Yes, this I did write it with the mind of taking out jargon and giving people a really simple format of how to understand money, uh, how to understand how money works, and some workbooks in there, like there's actual stuff you can do in there to start building what we call money purpose. So if you go to Simon Sinek's why. If you take that to the money conversation, most people live in a, in a world where if, if I could have more money, then I could do these certain things, then I would be happy, right? Mm -hmm. We flip that on, it, on the head and go, be, do, have. Nice. If I be empowered around money and live into the fact that I'm going to create more money in my life, then I will start doing things in a certain way, then I will have all of those things that I actually want to have. Right, right? So, so do, be, have. So we do the be, do, have conversation. Be, do, have. Instead of the, you know, if I could have more, then I would do more, then I would be more. Okay, well, let's start out there. What is the being? What, do, what does that mean and what does that look like for people? So, um, so I'll give the example of what it looks like for me because I was a musician. I lived a great deal of my life without any money you know, living on five bucks a day on the road. So money for me was the enemy for a long period of time. So an empowerment around money is understanding that it's just a tool. That's mm. all it is. It's not this big diamond in the sky. It is simply a tool that is created. As a matter of fact, they printed every day in droves. At one point, the U.S. Uh, during the two, coming out of the 2008 crisis was, pr was printing $80 billion a month. Wow. So there's lots of it out there. It, my job is really just to go get it. Right. So by changing your framework around what money truly is, which is just a tool that I can use for the betterment of my life is sort of a step one. And we do that by walking people through uh, what we call a blueprint or a blueprint. What is important to you about money? So that's why we, we sort of take on the role of money mentors. We want to start having that conversation with people to get them clear on why they're actually making money and what it's going to fulfill on for them. Totally, right? Because, I mean, it, I, I like how that answers a, a pretty fundamental question, like why do you need to have so much money coming in, right? Maybe you are making enough to sustain your life in a way that's going to make you really happy, right? Yep. But um, if you, you know, go out and you try to start a new business or find all these multiple streams of income and you add all the stress and work onto your life, you could potentially like just derail that entire thing from functioning well, right? So it's like yeah. really get in touch with the why behind why do they want more money? That's definitely huge. Right. And if you can't manage what you already have, having more of the same is right. not going to solve the problem. Yeah. You're still going to be left with not being able to manage what's actually coming in. Well, what they, you know, they talk about the fastest way to like destroy a person is to let them win the lottery. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine if someone has a somewhat destructive personality and now they have an unlimited money or relatively unlimited money supply? Like their life is either going to go one of two directions, probably accelerate greatly or, you know, they can crash and burn pretty quick too. Yeah, I think the stat is that actually 9 out of 10 lottery winners end up back 
where they were or worse off. And you hear that too about athletes or a lot of celebrities yeah. that they're claiming bankruptcy all the time. I mean, look at pro sports. I mean, they're getting paid millions of dollars a year, but as soon as their career is over, boom, like where is it? It's gone, right? Yeah, well, they upper limit, right? If you understand upper limiting, they hit that, they hit that ceiling of what they actually can handle in a capacity level for what they've integrated in their lives and they can't manage it. Right. Right. So the being is kind of changing your frame around money, um, yeah. maybe dealing with some of the fears. Now, there are some legit fears like involved with finances. I mean, like we just talked about how if you're in a great amount of debt, like that can be crippling for your life. Um, so how do you how do you manage uh, fears with people when it comes to like maybe you know wanting to take more risks and wanting to make more money, but then you know not wanting to have to declare bankruptcy? Right. So uh, two things there. So on the risk scale, uh, for me, risk is all about calculated risk. Right. It's it's looking at you know let's look at you guys for uh, as an example. You're sure. entrepreneurs. Yeah. You started a business. Right. Was there risk involved in starting? Absolutely. Yeah. Did you calculate sort of what, you know, how are we going to navigate through this? What is, what is the upside versus the amount of risk we're putting on the table? Definitely. Right. So you start doing that. You teach people how money is actually a tool and what it can benefit them and, and how they can control the supply coming in and going out. Right. Right. And that is once you start to do that, people can actually start to see because I've, I've, you know, I've experienced this in my own in my own practice. People actually start to get that. Oh, so if I. I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, emotional spending is the worst case of, of destructive money practice that somebody could have. Right. We live in a digital age where you can now walk into some place and pay for anything on your cell phone yeah. without any mind to whether you actually have the money or not. Yeah. Right? Especially when you're shopping online too. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, just, go to, just take an average guy going to Costco to go grocery shopping. Yeah. They're grocery shopping and they come home with a kayak <laughs> yeah, or lawn chairs or a new TV or, or whatever. They never went there for that. But yeah. while they're there, they're like, oh, I've always kind of wanted, you know, and they talk themselves into it. And it's like, I've got room on my credit card, which isn't their money. It's the bank's money, really. Mm -hmm. And they buy it. And then they get the bill at the end of the month. And they're like, why is this thing always so high? Mm. Right. Because there's no mindset or practice in place to understand that. By doing that, the things that you said were really important. Like, so if you're a family, you know, you're a family of four, and maybe the most important thing is 18 months from now, I want to take my kids to Disneyland. Well, we want to show you that that's very possible in your life, but yeah. there are some control mechanisms that we need to put in place to make sure it's deliverable. Right. And and when you have that conversation with somebody, and they start to see that that's really that's what's most important, and they're actually going to achieve it then the training of not having emotional spending is actually more possible. Right. There's emotional spending, and there's also like just the impulse of spending. Yes. Like, I guess kind of the same thing. Um, now, I've heard that in Canada, the average um, non-mortgage debt is around 40 grand. Is that what it is per person? What, could you? Could I, I don't know, but that? I'd say the last, the last numbers I ever saw on, on debt that has nothing to do with with homes, as you said, or with mortgages, yeah, yeah, it was like car loans and averages was somewhere between thirty to, to forty eight thousand dollars or something. Right, so, which is that's a lot of debt that's going to a liability, which is not going to make you any money. Basically, yeah, right? yeah. Well, I mean, it, you look, just look at a car loan, and I mean, <laughs> try and that's the other thing lot, too. Right? I mean, you, you know, you're going to go out if somebody goes out and buy one of these fancy sports cars, whatever. Yeah, I mean, you're going to be paying that for that for a while, most yeah. likely, right? So, all right, we've covered um, the being, how to get into that right state. Now, let's yeah. go into doing so yeah. that's the next part so right. be do awesome what, what's there so the bloom your money concept is really a five-step process right so we start off with the why you want to do something okay so we and we go deep on that to understand why we're actually doing things then we take you know next step would be to go well where are you today you know what have you got for assets what have you got for liabilities uh, what is your cash flow and we start to build out all of the inf all the data and information that we actually require then we look at debt. So step four would be to actually look at all of the debts that you have and can we find efficiencies there? You know, one of the things that people don't realize is they always focus on rate. So let's look at that for a moment. So let's say you have a car loan where you're paying five and a half percent interest on a car loan and you owe maybe $7,000 left on it and your payments are $680 a month, right? And you owe $15,000 on a line of credit that is uh, at 2%, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say. So people will get tied up thinking, oh, I need to just have cheaper rates all the time. So, so they'll, they'll focus their cash flow on that. Whereas right. what I want to do is eliminate that 
that car debt as fast as I can, right? It's not the rate that I care about. It's the cash flow that it's eating up. All right. Are you talking about like a debt consolidation? No, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be debt consolidation. It can be that, you know what, I'm going to lower the payments on everything else. Like a, sorry, my example was incorrect. Oh, a okay, high interest okay. credit sorry, card. Gotcha, gotcha. So an 18% interest credit card. Yes, yes. They're going, I want to pay that off first right. because I'm paying so much interest. But the demand on that is only, let's say, $100 a month is all you need to pay. Right. Meanwhile, your cash flow is getting eaten up by this massive car loan. Right. So stop the bleeding on the more critical So spots. let's yeah. eliminate that car down, gotcha. uh, that car loan as quickly as we can, and then transfer that payment over to the high interest one. Yeah. And now we'll crush that much quicker, right? Right. So it's counterintuitive to always focus on the rate that because I'm paying a higher rate here, I should focus on that when in actual fact, cash flow is king. You can have a profitable business, not have any cash flow and go bankrupt. Right. Right. Yeah. So we want to, we, what we call this is our cash flow plan, the bloom cash flow plan. So yes. step five of this is actually drawing up the do. So now we're going to show you how to spend your money. We're going to give you not a budget. I hate the word budgeting. Budgeting is limiting. It's like, it's like dieting. Yeah. We, we want to give you a spending plan. Nice. So we're going to give you so much of your money every week that you can go spend on whatever the heck you want to spend it on. Don't care. And that's then we're your gonna, limit. Then we're going to teach you how to take the rest of this money to start eliminating the debt if that's the first focus, and then how to put it into the things that you told us were really important to you. Very smart. Not retirement. I do not start with a retirement conversation hmm. because an RSP, I've just imprisoned your money for the next 40 years. You can't access it. Not good or bad. It's just that's not where I want to start. And that's where our industry is kind of always leaning to, right? Yeah, it seems to be the first conversation you have yeah. when you sit down with any financial pro planner. So what kind of RSPs do you have, right? Yeah. And, and then that's what they start, you know, a couple hundred bucks a month every single month will go towards that. Yeah. You know, and, and retirement's important. But you know what? I know as a father of, you know, 10-year-old twin daughters, taking my kids on vacation and having that kind of family time is most important to me that that's huge and also like you know putting money in things that are more short short term um you know being able to afford a place to live all those things yeah or building important. up cash flow assets that actually create more cash flow because you know you're a business owner yeah your best dollar is in your business you yeah. can hyper grow your money inside of your business not take it out and put it into a retirement account so to start off in that conversation with somebody when without knowing the picture is is kind of backwards to me. I want to know what drives Andy, what right. really makes you fired up about getting money and where you want it to go. And totally. then we can build a plan for that, right? Right. So that would be the doing aspect. That would be the of, doing, yeah. Okay. And then the having is now you start to get to have the things you want. The yeah. things that you said were really important, not the random... I'm going to buy a kayak today. And then you're still left with that feeling like I'm not getting the things I really want. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, that's great. I'd like to really dive a little deeper into this, this, the idea of, um, you know, not acquiring too much debt or what happens when we do. And maybe you can talk a little bit about the 2008 financial crisis and, yeah. uh, how that came to be. And, you know, this, some people say it was orchestrated so people could make money from it. Some people say it was just, it's just how it all kind of happened and it just collapsed. Um, what's your take on that, what happened in 2008? Oof. <laughs> to sum it up. Yeah. Um, so here's how the banks work. It, when things are really bad, they're very conservative, right? So then they pull in all of the stuff and they become the conservative money you know, gurus that are out there and they won't do anything. They won't lend money. They, everything is like, oh, we got to watch, we got to watch, we got to watch. Yeah. And then as the economy starts to boom and things loosen up, they become more loosey-goosey with the money. And it's like, hey, we can fund here, we can fund that. And, you know, everybody's making money, the profits are going up, and we all kind of get, everybody gets crazy. Mm. So if you look at 2008, that's what happened. I mean, if I were to sum it up, things got crazy. A lot of money was being made off of really bad... Um, uh, investment opportunities, if you will. They were taking, without trying to be too much garbly garb, they were taking really secure bonds and partnering them with really, really bad debt. And what I mean by really bad debt is you heard of the ninja loans. Yeah. So the ninja loans back in 08 were, you know, no income, no job, no assets, no problem. We'll still let you have a mortgage. Basically, if you could fog a mirror, <laughs> they gave you money. Right. That's what, you know, if I were to sum it up, that's what happened. It became insane where anybody 
could get money and, you know, buy condos, buy, you know, I'm going to flip this, I'm going to flip that, I'm going to buy eight of these things and flip them next week for a million dollars more was the... And that period went from what, like 2001 to 2008, maybe a little bit, what was it I would say that it really started, it probably really started in 05, 06 is when, okay. is when we, because we had recovered out of the NASDAQ crisis and and that's when the that's when the mindset of just starting to flip houses and uh, real estate prices were going up and yes. and then because a lot of people made a lot of money during oh yeah, that time yeah 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 and a lot of people and a very few amount of people made a lot of money on the crisis right right the guys that were looking at the numbers going this doesn't add up you can't you know you can't have this much debt in and not have it secured by quality assets right? It's going to blow up. And so the big short, if you've ever seen the movie or read the book, the big short best, you know, it's a, it's not a documentary, but it could be really yeah. on what happened in 2008 that led up to the insanity of, you know, what, what they were doing. They were just basically giving money away, giving money away to people who couldn't afford mortgages. Mostly they right? couldn't, they, they, they would never, if you, if you were to look at 2011, where things had started to kind of loosen up a bit, but you know, there were still some some uh, some taps on. There's no way that any of those people would qualify for a mortgage or a loan in 2011, and that's even at three well, years after the crisis. Even now, right? it's even tighter, I imagine, right? Well, n now there's you know, now I'm worried. They're starting to get a little bit crazy again. You're starting to hear more and more about uh, discounted mortgages, right below prime. All of that stuff that was in place then is starting to come back, and it has different names now. That's the history, you know. History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes essentially, right? And right. that's that's we're going to see the same thing happening again. And and my fear is, if I were to have a fear as an advisor, it's going to be worse. Right now, you mentioned uh, before the podcast that during the 2008 financial crisis, that um, they allowed Lehman Brothers to fail, but then then they saved Goldman Sachs. And, yes, and that's because who was the gentleman? So so Paulson there? is the last Paulson. name, and he was he was basically handling Treasury at that time, and yeah. Paulson used to be the CEO of Goldman Sachs. So there was rumors or speculation out there that they sort of chose who would they would allow to fail. And Lehman Brothers was a, you know, a competitor with Goldman Sachs for years and years and years and years, but they didn't they decided not to bail out Lehman Brothers. They allowed them to fail, but then they made, you know, a lot of uh, uh, access to money for Goldman Sachs. Uh, you know, they took Washington Mutual, which savings and loan, which was collapsing and, and merged them into Bank of America. Like they started to just let other companies be okay, but Lehman Brothers was sort of their flagship. We're letting you go. So they, they took the fall. Yeah. Right. Um, what do you think about the idea that goes along with that of uh, too big to fail? Like, do you think that that's a real concept? Do you think that it's just everything's too big and like you know we can have like fluctuations, but uh, you know it, it can't fail completely? What do you think? Um, so it's interesting because I think Trump has recently had some news around that he's going to break up the banks or something. He said he said something to that effect, you know, three or four days ago. Um, well, the, I have to say it like the big too big to fail is real because that's what they did. I mean, they actually bailed out the the largest companies that were you know, off of the back of the taxpayer. Now, it's it's speculated that the um, American government made money in the end. You know, I don't know if that shows up back in the pocketbooks of actual Americans. Right. But they did, you know, what they were faced with was simply this. If we let this go, we don't know how bad it's going to get in terms of the Great Depression. Yeah. Well, are we going to see that kind of level of unemployment that kind of terror in the world where there's no jobs, there's no economy, nothing is moving. Well, the financial system sorts out its over exuberance, right. if you will. And that would be like a more pure definition of capitalism where you like, allow these bigger banks just to fail, right? Yeah. Well, if you, looked at, kind of if you looked at Austrian economics, the Austrians actually believe that, that the proper, the market, if you let the market do what it's supposed to do, it will sort itself out and things may get ugly, but it, it's because it needs to get ugly. Because there's been, you know, too much of one side happening that we need to actually have the other side now happen. We need a balance, right? Right. You know, the pendulum never, the pendulum always overswings both ways. Right. right? So, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all good. It's fine. Um, okay. So, and also before the podcast, you were speaking about how you think that there potentially might be an even bigger financial crisis looming. Uh, yeah. Can you get into maybe some predictions? I mean, maybe it's hard to predict that one, but... Uh, why do you think that's coming? Well, 
so I, I'm not going to predict. What I'm going to say is what what I know. So coming out of the crisis, we had a massive debt. 2008 was really a massive debt crisis. The solution to the debt crisis was to create more debt than ever before in the history of mankind, right? And you see that with the amount of money that was printed. When you look at, you know, uh, for fractional reserve banking, right? If we go back to that or fractional reserve lending so that people understand, it's that if you have $1,000 on deposit at the bank, they can, in essence, lend out $9,000 against it. So the fraction is they have a fraction on reserve to pay somebody back, and then they lend out nine times that amount, right? right? So where does that money come from? It's printed out of thin air. It doesn't actually exist. They hit a computer key and it's boom. You know, when you when you, you settle a mortgage, your, yeah, like, when you buy a house and you yeah. settle a mortgage, there's no actual, you know, counting of dollars that are transacted. It's the hit of a button and it's just a bunch of credits and debits that change hands, right? So we came out of 08 and printed more money than ever seen before. The US was printing eighty billion dollars a month and flooding the market with it. How does that work? Interest rates were kept artificially low. So when you have all of this money, the U.S. government was buying its own debt. That's what they were doing to keep rates low. When you, if you think of a free market system, if you have uh, you know, a bunch of boats for sale and you have too many of those boats and not enough buyers, right, you're going you're, you're gonna to have to lower prices, mm -hmm. right? Well, in this case, what the U.S. was doing, because bonds work inverse in pricing, is that they were buying every bond that was on the market. So therefore, they kept the prices of bonds high, which drives interest rates down. So bonds work inverse to pricing, right? So the interest rate comes down, the higher the price you pay for the bond, right? So they, when you have a, somebody standing there with $80 billion every month going, as soon as the market opens, going, I'm going to buy it all, interest rates were kept artificially low. And they still are low. So my concern would be, how do we pay back all of this debt? If we get inflation, the only thing they can do is raise rates to start fighting off inflation. Inflation, by definition, is that you have too much money supply for the goods that are available, basically. And it, so it's making the goods more expensive. Correct. Yeah. So because you have too much money in circulation, right, the value of your dollar has diminished. Yes. So I need to charge more money to get equal value for what I used to get a year ago. Therefore, prices go up. Yeah because the value of the currency is dropping. Yeah, so prices right? go up, in, in fact, wages as well? Well, that, that's, so that's the, one, that's the one driver that freaks out all bankers in the world of the Federal Reserve or the Bank of Canada is wage control, because if, wages, if, if workers start demanding higher wages and get them, then you get what, what they call the velocity of money. So if you come out of 08, there was no velocity of money. Nobody was spending. Nobody was lending. There was no circulation. So pump the system, pump the system, pump the system to get it working. Now, if you start to get too much velocity, you need to pull down interest rates so that you can start calling in the money supply. Right. Right. So wages will be the determining factor in a lot of cases of how fast interest rates will rise. Right. Okay. So wages are the determining factor. It's a major. And it's a major factor in in how quickly they want to start because that's well, that's that, inflationary well, to them. Exactly. Well, if, yeah. Exactly. If wages are increasing, would that not not only also increase like, the cost of goods and services? Because yeah. Because what happens is you have more money in circulation. Yeah. So then you get uh, more demand for things. So you have less goods available. So prices start to go up, and then. So then it's like that little wage increase didn't really matter, anyways. Yeah. Yeah. The, the wage increase didn't matter on a level of of the spending for the person, but it does in terms of the economy and how fast money is moving through the system, right? They want to keep inflation at like a two to 3%. Okay. That's their magic zone. Yes. So that's yes. why they raise and lower rates throughout history to try to, to try to keep in that magic zone. Okay. So now we have this huge amount of debt, something that we've never had before. Yeah. Um, and it just seems like the bigger the debt or, you know, you know, Taller the tree, the harder the fall, kind of thing, yes. you know. And uh, we we have a pretty big tree of debt right now. Yeah. Um, how what would that look like? Do you think how how would that come about if all of a sudden there was a huge financial crisis again, and um, it all started falling apart? Like how how would that start? Man, if I know, <laughs> <laughs> I could potentially be a millionaire. Right. I, I you know here's the thing is that what we teach is that. If we understand how money works, 
like this isn't about fear mongering. I don't want to fear make everybody scared. Like, oh my gosh, it's the world is coming to an end. It's more that uh, let's empower ourselves, understand how it works, so we can put in place things for us to capitalize on, right? That that's more what our concern is in right. terms of in terms of educating people is how can we position you to win in a situation where that might happen. All right. Well, let's get into that. So, yeah. assuming there is a financial crisis looming, yeah. What do you advise people to do? So currently, uh, so we, we do a couple of things. One is we have a portfolio management company in Toronto that looks after all of our retirement assets for clients or their investments, right? Right now, they're about 50% cash, right? So they're not favorable of where the market conditions currently are. So if I were to take a page out of Warren Buffett's book, you know, when everybody else is fearful, he's greedy. And mm -hmm. when everybody else is greedy, he's fearful. So we're starting to get into that territory of people being greedy, right? Wanting to put money. As soon as your you know, cab driver or butcher is starting to give you stock tips, that's an indication that it's likely time to lighten up on the investment side and start holding more cash. Saving. Yeah, start having more cash. Because cash is king in those crises. When panic sets in and the market starts to drop, you want to be able to step forward and be a buyer. Right. Right. You don't want to be forced into selling at that time because you've over leveraged yourself. Now, what, like what's even a, what what is a realistic amount somebody can save? Let's say you're, you're making your, the average Canadian wage. Right. You know, how are they going to build up enough to actually be able to snap up some of these things that have uh, fallen off so far? So there's a couple things. One is, first of all, we recommend that you have six months of cash to pay your debts, like to pay your bills. That, that that is like a starting point. So it's point. not three months anymore. It's six months of cash is the ultimate scenario so safety that net. you, safety net, right? Yeah. Um, I also, you know, one of the things that I do personally is I actually have real hard silver in possession. Yeah. If there's ever a currency crisis, I believe that hard metals would be your saving grace. So again, I, I don't have millions of dollars in this, but I just have it as a safety net. Yeah. So the first thing we want to do is build a defensive strategy. For people not always be on the offense your best who wins all of the trophies in sports the defense the teams that have the best defense yep. that can turn it into offense on a moment's notice are the ones that typically end up winning the championship sure so we actually per, we preserve we prefer to start with a defensive tactic and strategy around building up cash um, having that in a safe place where it's not going to be affected by the market then start looking at, okay, now we'll start building up some investments. Where's the best place to put those? Is it a TFSA? Is it an RSP? If you're a corporate, is it to, is it to build it up in the corporation? Yep. Right? If, you have, if you have that in your back pocket. Right. So it's more of a process of looking at each person as an individual, going mm -hmm. through that why with them so that we can determine how to best navigate going forward. So how much do you think is a, is a so you see six months as a safety net yeah. of your salary. Yeah. Um, what about like if you want to be in a position where if there was a crash that you could go and capitalize on that a little bit, how much would you need saved up? Well, uh, I mean, this really depends on how much you want to buy. Yeah, I think right. it's it's more it's more dependent on what your current cash flow is, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we have clients that make you know five six hundred thousand dollars a year. We have clients that make uh, sixty seventy thousand dollars a year. So for each one, it's different. It's more that if you look at 08, and especially for somebody in retirement, as the economy falls and the markets are falling, the last thing you want to have to do is be forced to sell those assets. Yeah. Because you're selling into a falling market. So you want to actually be able to step up to the plate at that time. So it's being mindful that we're not allowing people to let the debts get out of control, right? Where all of a sudden in a falling crisis, they get laid off or something happens. They have no access to cash. Now we're forced to sell investments, pull money out of an RSP or a TFSA in order to survive. Right. That's not the scenario you want to be in. We want to be on the opposite side of that all yeah. the time. Yeah. That we don't know what's going to happen. So let's plan first to defend, right? And be ready to attack, right? if you will. Yes. Uh, I heard something a little bit uh, let's just say intimidating. And it was okay. that the average millennial is going to need $1.5 million uh, to retire comfortably. Is it, do you have any numbers on that or any uh, idea? I would that? argue that it could be more, but it all depends on their lifestyle, right? It all, it really all depends on what is their ideal lifestyle that they want to have. 
you know, if, like what, what, what kind of lifestyle would that get you if you had that saved for retirement? Well, if you already, if so, you know, let's look at if you lived in Vancouver, you yeah. would need to already own your home. <laughs> right. Right. Which is like, a big challenge right yes. there. Yeah. And on one and a half million dollars on a, you know, it's safe to say that you could generate about $90,000 a year of tax efficient income say 6% of sort of a rule of 6%. Right. So drawdown. that's fairly comfortable then. Yeah. So if you have no living cost other than, you know, heat, some cable, Food, internet, et cetera, and then some eating, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, then you could have a comfortable living. You could take some, you know, decent vacations every couple of years and you'd be okay. Right. right. You'd want a cash flow plan to, to manage that. Absolutely. Because you want to be mindful of the cash that's coming in and the cash that's going out. Yes. Right. Um, but in the future, don't forget that you know, a million and a half dollars today was, you know, 10 bucks in 1901. Right. Right. When yeah. you factor in inflation, it's probably not that bad. Exactly. But, but yeah, but you get the idea. Yeah, right. So totally. in the future, yes. Uh, you, you know, somebody who's 30 years old today and retires at 65, 35 years from now is probably going to need more like $3 million of money at that time in order to retire. Wow. Right. Which would be the equivalent. You know, I read in a I read in a book uh, the creature from Jekyll Island, which is the history of the Federal Reserve. Right. I heard about that. I heard that's what the island where they all went and that's, secretly met and signed yes, the, yeah. the, the Federal Reserve Act. Right. Yes. Correct. Yeah. 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 1913. So uh, there was only five people involved in that that actually did, that actually put that together. But I read in there that if you if you were to research it, the price of the greatest toga at the height of the Roman Empire. The price that you would have paid then is the same price you would pay today. Hmm. The cost of labor and goods has not changed. That, okay, right. Yes. That makes what sense. has changed is the value of the currency. Yeah. Right. So if you yeah. take this back to Roman times, Caesar couldn't pay his army, didn't have enough money or didn't have enough gold coin in the coffers to pay his army. So what did he do? He had his alchemists start trimming the edges of the gold coins and making up new ones, hmm. right? Then the army got paid and they went to the, you know, to the merchants to spend the money and the merchant grabs the coin and goes, this doesn't feel right, hmm. right? This is not the same weight of gold. Wow. I can't allow you to pay that amount of gold for this. You need to give me one and a half of those now. That so was, that the, was first, the first inflation. Correct, that was yeah. the first use of inflation where Caesar started to trim the coins to create more money because he didn't have enough for what he owed. So this is actually uh, a, an old historic um, technique this that's is, been done this for is, a long time. So fiat currency, if we go back to that, yeah. which is paper money that has no asset backing it, there's been 6,000 fiat currencies in the history of mankind. They've all failed. Every single one of them. And right now we're sitting on nothing but a world of fiat currency. There's no money out there that's or currency that's in circulation that is backed by anything. So it's not possible to manage it and continue it going somehow. I, again, I don't have nearly enough knowledge to understand that or predict it properly. But it's, it seems like they're, they're attempting just to keep this thing going for as long as it yeah, goes. Kick the can down the road. And who knows how long. Hey, they could do this for another 150 years. I have no idea. Right. All yeah. I know is when you look at history, when you look at the numbers, when you see what they're doing, I ask the question, how is this going to work out? And nobody can, I have not read a single article that tells me they know how they're going to get out of this crisis. Let's go back to Japan. You know, uh, uh, 1980, the, the Nikkei was at its height of 35 or 36,000 points, the index itself. It's never seen that again since then, right? It's at about 18,000 today. It went down to as low as 6,000. They've had interest rates at 0% for 30 years trying to get out of their over exuberance. And how has that worked out for them? They have the, the oldest pop, one of the oldest populations on the, cl uh, on the planet, right, in terms of age. And they're all savers. They're not spenders. And they're, you know, they need, they rely on the rest of the world to buy their goods. Right. Right. That's why they build such good cars. I guess. I don't, <laughs> you know, they do indeed, yes. Yeah. But yeah, so I don't, I don't know how this is going to work out. But the, da the data says to me that we are in a period of time where nobody knows how it's going to go. And I would much rather be in a position of strength than in a position of weakness. Right. Right. So basically you're, you're, you're talking about building up your defenses. So if it all comes falling down one day, you're, you have your little protective bubble and you should come out of it. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. My job is to protect my clients as much as I possibly can from not only what we don't know, but from themselves as well. 
Gotcha. Let's be mindful of the money that you have and learn to learn to manage that really well. Because then when you make more money, then you'll just have more of the things you want. Right, right, right? on. Um, I wonder if you could talk about a few alternatives. And do you have any opinions or ideas about Bitcoin? And what, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, so, um, well, Bitcoin is very, it's very interesting to me because also if I were to reference the... Um, Creature from Jekyll Island, he, he, his closing remarks on there is that the, the perfect scenario is a, an electronic currency where no underground economy can exist. Because mm. then they can control every single dollar that is transacted everywhere on the and planet. And you see every transaction. Right, and yeah. you see every transaction. So, yeah. you know, if I was a conspiracy theorist, I'd go, ooh, was, is Bitcoin really being positioned as that? And it's being sold as something else, but really it's a way to get us to move over to an electronic currency where now everything is controlled. You know, if it were a conspiracy, don't you think they'd be moving a little faster on that one? Because I, yeah, if I, they, you know, I yeah. don't think it's – I'm just yeah. saying that, you know, the brain, the brain goes to weird places totally. sometimes. Totally. I, I get what you're saying. You yes. know, you want to look at all yeah. sides of the – pardon the pun. You want to look at all sides of the coin, right? Yes. You want to you go, is this what it is or is this this, right? So I think Bitcoin is interesting. What I don't – what I'm not comfortable with is the amount of volatility, right? It, it's too volatile. Uh, it's still an investment. It's not a currency, so to speak. Right. It's exactly. It, it's it, it seems to overall be uh, increasing over time. Yeah. Consistently. Yeah. But and, it but is the, volatile. It's the, it's the, so it's like you can't use it as a consistent currency because of the volatility. Yeah. You don't. Re, you know, tomorrow morning you could wake up with fifty percent less cash value than you yeah. thought you had. For those who don't know maybe uh, what Bitcoin is, could you briefly explain uh, Bitcoin to them? Yeah, it's so Bitcoin is basically, uh, if you were to think of it as a bunch of numbers of zero zero ones on a computer that where every transaction is absolutely imprinted, you cannot, what you cannot do is create fraud in the world of Bitcoin, right? Every transaction is marked and everybody knows who made that transaction, right? So it, you can't fluff it up if you want but it is really just uh, an electronic system of calculating that there, i believe there's only oh I, i'm not going to guess because i don't i don't remember when i read up on it but there's only so many amount of bitcoins yeah, that they're going to create yes. Yes. but then what they're going to do is split them yes. right so what you could end up is that you're right now it's at 1300 dollars us dollars per bitcoin they now make might make those bitcoins two for one Right. So now you've got a half a Bitcoin or whatever you would call right. it. So now you've got yeah. two that are worth six hundred and fifty dollars each. Right. Yeah. So they can keep splitting it infinite. Yeah. Right. But it maintains its value. What what's like I said, what it scares me about it is the volatility that I'm I'm not comfortable yet allocating a lot of money to something that right now is at its highest yeah. point. Right. Basically. And that's because the, the pool of Bitcoin is still like comparably super tiny it's like yeah. a pond versus an ocean correct and you drop a pebble a pebble in the pond and yeah you're going to get those fluctuations but you drop a pebble in the ocean you're not going to even see it yeah you know so until it grows to a bigger thing and people start adopting it um then it's not going to uh you know yeah, yeah it's going to have that volatility you think people will ever adopt something like well bitcoin? i think we're at the early adopter stage right well we are well we you definitely got, you got some early adopters yeah, yeah. so I, you know we're definitely at an early adopter stage of that and then the question is does it become something that hits that you know hits that tipping, tipping point, point and yeah. you know over 10 percent, and then now people start f flocking to it Right. Then the early adopters will be heavily rewarded, right? I mean, yeah, that's how it always goes. Yeah, so there's yeah. risk to it, and it's not, you know, it's not something I'm uncomfortable having people buy, but it's not something I'm ready to back the truck yeah. up to and say. Would you Would you recommend that as part of your like diversification, or not really? Uh, you know, I don't know that I, right now. I'm still a little more on the hard asset of having some actual silver and gold in my possession because if the computer system went down. You got that. I can't, yeah. I can't get they access to it. One right. of the best ways to uh, get involved with Bitcoin is if you have a business or service, is just to be open to accepting it. Yeah. That way you're not changing any of your actual money right. per se. But if you have a business or service where you can be like, yeah, I'll accept Bitcoin for certain things, maybe within reason, yep. then then you're in the game. And yep. that's, that's that's ultimately what's going to bring people yeah. uh, into working with it. So if, let's say you can start buying and they have a whole network set up for this kind of stuff. Now that you have some Bitcoin, oh, maybe I can... Uh, get some of my supplies and my stock and my inventory using this Bitcoin money. So you actually now are using it yeah. in your cent in your business, whatever that could be. You know, that's a great tip and I'm going to use that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's yeah. beautiful. I, that's great advice. And I think, I think too with Bitcoin, you know, it's the big appeal is this decentralization network. So yes. this basically kills the federal reserve. Yeah. And if people value that, 
which ultimately I believe they should instead of being manipulated by what these people who we don't know whose interests or what their interests are and what their big scam is because or scheme, uh, we don't know what their plan is. There's so much hidden stuff with the decentralization of it all. That's that's the truest sense of what it should be. And basically they're equating Bitcoin as like the Internet of money, the way the Internet was for information. Yeah. And how it decentralized information now news. Now we can do this podcast and talk about this stuff. Whereas before to get this sort of information, information out, you either had to have a radio station, a newspaper or a television station. Yeah. The internet destroyed that. Yeah. And all those things are crumbling. And that's what Bitcoin could do to the federal reserve. Right. Yeah. Well, shout out to uh, Andre Ant- Antonopoulos. If you're listening that he's yes. at a Andreas, Bitcoin, yeah. Andreas Antonopoulos. If anyone wants to hear a really good podcast strictly on Bitcoin, go to London real and yeah, look I for him. Uh, I will do that. Yeah. Uh, Andreas Antonopoulos. He's, he's, and he, yeah. I think he's been on there twice. He's been on Joe Rogan about three or four yeah, times. And, and I would uh, go chronologically through those ones. Um, and listen to what he says because he breaks it all down and then builds it up to where it's going and where its evolution is because it's still evolving. Yeah, that's the cool thing. It's still evolving. They don't even know what this is going to become. Yeah, it's cool. Okay, so we've covered Bitcoin. Um, now let's talk about silver and gold. Yeah, you know one thing about silver and gold that's always um, confused me a little bit is why why do we have any inherent value in it? Because <laughs> you know, let's be honest. If there was a massive crisis, you can't eat gold. You can't do much with it. It's a very soft metal that's not really that functional. Uh, where is the inherent value in that precious metal come yeah, from? Yeah, it's just like it's 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 been around for every culture has basically revered, le- it. revered gold. Yeah. You know, the thing about gold is that every single ounce of gold that has ever been uncovered is still in circulation. Unless yeah, it was lost it at sea. It doesn't decompose, right? right? It, like, it doesn't break down. And, and it's sought after, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... You know, it's it's just it's the status. It has the status it has. You know, I don't know why it does, but maybe it's that lack of like the fact that it's evergreen. It could, it just lasts forever. That well, it's and just, it's and it's scarce. Yeah, it's, it's not rare. easy to get. Yeah, right? Rare. Yeah. yeah, right. So it's you know, for the earliest of time, that's how we traded. Right when we needed money, instead of you know trading two ox for you know some eggs because you couldn't carry around ox to make you a trade. Some old coins. You then being able to have something that you could transfer around that was uh, that was fungible that was easy to carry etc was that's where sort of gold started to become a currency and right? i guess that's where it kind of uh, dovetails into uh how we came up with paper money because gold is quite heavy so it's like if it's actually if you have a certain amount of gold and it's backed by paper well that actually still kind of makes sense right because yeah. you have backing it yeah now let's say for example there was um again a big crisis you have your gold and silver um, what do you do at that point with the gold and silver? Do you start chipping off little pieces of it and be like, all right, I'll give you this little nugget for a loaf of bread or like, yeah. whatever. <laughs> um, you know, what do you do with it at that point? Well, uh, so here's, here's what I, so I don't think there's going to be, you know, um, I can't even think of the Denzel Washington movie that was a few years ago where it was, you know, pretty much a desolate world. Um, oh, uh, book of Eli. Yes. Book of Eli. So I'm not, in, I'm not envisioning that. What I, what I, if I were to give my concern on stuff I've read, it's a currency crisis. It's like, what if we wake up and the U.S. dollar has lost its reserve status, right? What does that do to the entire currency system? I don't know. I mean, everything's pegged to the U.S. dollar. So if it's lost its reserve status, what does that make my Canadian dollars worth, right? So my fear is that I wouldn't have a currency in which to trade. But if I had, you know, some some one ounce coins or some 10 ounce coins of silver, something that was an actual, you know, peg to money, so to speak, or had a value that might be something I could then take out and trade. Right. That that's more what I worry. I worry more about a currency crisis than all out, you know, like, anarchy because it would take them a few months to figure out how they're going to re, you know, I'll reconstitute that system right right so you're seeing that gold and silver is is going to be worth something when they do that yeah if that happens then then i've got something sort of in my back pocket that could get my family through a few months right of survival that's it that's all it's for it's not not because i think the world is going to end or i'm you know a doomer it's just that hey they've printed a lot of money the history tells me all fiat currencies have eventually failed or come under some sort of pressure what if we wake up and the u.s says you know what we're actually going to make every dollar you have um, it's going to take ten dollars to make one dollar now, right? As one way of pulling in how much currency is exposed in the marketplace. What does right. that do? I don't know what that's going to do to uh, in in terms of a financial crisis. 
Gotcha. Right. So it, it's just it's just really sort of like a, hey, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen. I just have some protection. Right. So, you know, in my own uh, financial world, I think of a few different things. I think of real estate. I think of having some RESP, some RRSPs, uh, some savings. Yep. Um, you know, that's that's basically it. So, I mean, like, what are some other things people can put their eggs into that uh, could be potential short-term or even long-term investments? All right. So we're going to get a little controversial here. Okay. So one of the strategies that we use is called Bloom Banking. It's uh, it's also in the U.S. It's called the Infinite Banking System. So if I – and I'll just give you my own example. I have 10 whole life insurance policies on uh, my wife, myself, and my children. Right, And what happens is that inside of those whole life insurance policies, I have structured them in such a way that I have the maximum cash buildup inside them as a savings component, and yes, they provide life insurance. But what happens inside of that is it grows tax-free, and at any time, I can borrow against my policy, no questions asked, from the insurance company. Hmm. I can also take them to a bank as collateral and borrow 100% of their cash value wow. because they are considered absolute solid investments there they huh. can't go down in value amazing right yeah so this was that book becoming your own banker that i read in 2013 and i looked at that and went wow no i've been in this industry at that point you know almost 13 years and nobody had ever told me that i could structure a life insurance policy in that way that if i needed access to capital i can fill out one page a one page form send it into the insurance company and five days later the money's in my bank Wow. No questions asked because it's my savings right. that's in there. But my savings stays in the policy to grow. The insurance company lends me money from their excess capital. Huh. Right? So what is, how is that different than an RSP? Well, the fact is my money is not imprisoned. I have access to my capital when I want it. I and can cash. Borrow I, against it. I can borrow against it, right? I can yep. cash the thing out anytime I want. It grows tax-free. It's creditor protected. Right. Wow. So if I get sued, they can't get access to that because it's a life insurance policy and it can't go down in value. That sounds like a pretty solid one. Yeah. Right. But it's not. Where's the know. controversy? So the controversy is that if I if I engage somebody into a whole life insurance policy, I'll get paid commission. OK. Right. So there's a big payout to brokers when they sell these. Right. Counter that with if I put your money in an RSP and I put you on a fee for service account. I can generate fees off you for the next 40 years. Right. As long as that money's in there and I'm charging a fee, I'm getting paid the whole time that you're in there. Right. If I were to put you in a life insurance policy as part of our strategy, I get paid up front, and that's pretty much it. Uh, Would you say it's almost uh, advantageous enough to, I mean, depending on what age you're at and where it's all at, but to actually pull out from your RSPs and do something like that? I would, so I don't like to make blanket statements. Sure. I would really have to look at what somebody's cash flow is, what their tax bracket is, like what's going on to, to call whether that is the right choice to make. But it wouldn't scare me to make that call. Gotcha. Cool, right? So it's a potential. It's a potential. And, and here's the great thing is when you're in retirement, so let's say you have RSPs, right? And they've done well, and now you're retired and you're pulling the cash out. You're taxed as income at your highest marginal rate, right? So you've got a future tax liability growing. Inside of a whole life insurance policy, if you take the money out, you're gonna be taxed on it, right? However, if you borrow against the policy, it's non-taxable. It's not income, hmm. it's a loan, Yeah. right? So let's say you've built up a million dollars worth of cash in your policy, and every year you want an extra $30,000 for that magic vacation, right? So you start to borrow out of your policy for that. You're not taxed on that. And the death benefit will go to pay back that debt first. Hmm. So all you're doing is accessing the very death benefit that you've set up for yourself ahead of time during retirement. Wow. So for us, it's part of the conversation around wealth building because it has so many advantages. Totally. Now, yeah. if, it was, if it was designed another way and not life insurance, I would be equally as excited about it. Right. It just so happens that the only... But the life insurance is structured that way. That, yeah, life insurance has been structured that way for 200 years. Huh. It has, you know, if you, if you look at, um, it's a wonderful life. Yes. There's a moment in there where he's crumbling and he goes into the banker and says, I've got this life insurance policy that's worth $500 as collateral. And he's like, that's not enough money. That's how people used to save money. Wow. It was through whole life insurance, hmm. properly structured hmm. whole life insurance policies. I had no idea. There's a little bit about it in the book as awesome. well. Like, like we cover all of the things that we believe are, 
are, are defensive strategies. And that is a defensive strategy because you're building up cash that yeah. you can access anytime you want. Yeah. Right. So if you were looking for a safe storage of, of wealth or, or cash, one of those policies is great to do that. Gotcha. And there's lots of controversy against them. I'll be called, you know, I'm just out to make a sale and I'm just out to generate commission and blah, 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 blah. And I get that, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take on that fight. That's, right. You know. Yeah. I, I wish I knew more because then I, I, I banter a little bit with you on that, but yeah. I, I can't. So um, what are some other things you would recommend to people? Um, so if you're in a family situation, get both of you talking. Talk about money. Money is not, you know, when I started Edward Jones, I used to door knock in the neighborhood of, um, of uh, Kitsilano and Arbutus and, uh, and Shaughnessy area. Sure. Right? Yeah. And my experience of that was, I think I knocked on 1,500 doors, you know, looking to start my business. My experience of that was that people would rather talk to me about their sex life than money. Mm. <laughs> money is like this taboo thing that we're not supposed yeah, to. Yeah, it's uh, even more taboo than There's a lot of that. emotional drama around is, money like totally. i don't have enough or i should have more or i've done poorly or i'm too rich well, or... i think is that because it's just a, such a big indicator of well it could be it is one indicator of success in your life and yes. like so it's an indication of how valuable you are as a person on one level yeah 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 it is and 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 then you know i would look at that another way and also in a good friend of mine dr suki him and i talk about this stuff all the time that yeah what he would say is that you know if you have a mindset that anybody that's rich is bad you're setting yourself up to have a, buy, a bad mindset around money. Totally. It's like there's a lot of wealthy people out there who have done very well for themselves that are awesome human beings. Yeah, They've yeah. just done well for themselves. So kind of changing that uh, the, paradigm around your idea of money is bad. You know, yeah. and that, I wonder, um, I've heard that a lot of that kind of good in, put in place by uh, Christianity because, you know, the whole thing is, you know, the, the meek shall inher inherit the earth. So it's like if you're poor and humble and don't have a lot, uh, well, the kingdom will be yours after you die, right? Yeah. So there's been that like really instilled in us since, well, from who knows how long, yeah. right? So um, and I would imagine that has like a deeper symbolism than like just being poor in this physical reality. It's probably a uh, some other analogy or something. Yeah, you know? but it also did. I mean, there was a lot of stigma around the idea of accumulating wealth and that it equaled that you were a bad person right. for whatever reason, right? So mm. Going back to what yeah. you were speaking to, is just exploring a little bit where that yeah, might yeah. have come from but absolutely people do um a lot of times they associate people who are rich to being bad as well and if you think that and you don't want to be a bad person nobody wants to be a bad person of how you're going to accumulate money yeah right? there's a disconnect i don't remember the saying what was it like to worship money is evil the root of all evil yeah is money is the root of all evil or whatever or yeah, yeah. It, it which is like i think it's a misinterpretation at no point did it say having money is evil Right. It, it, maybe it goes back to the idea that the you can worship. crash and burn if you have too much and you don't use it right. Well, like, it's the worship of money. When you yeah. become just like, you know, if you look at, uh, um, uh, what was the, uh, the Hobbit, the Hobbit movies. Yeah. Right. When the Dwarf King goes back, I'm really like showing my age here. No, right? no, no. The Dwarf the King it's great goes back to the mountain and then he finally gets in there and now he has his gold back. What's he doing? He's like, he won't let it go now. Like he corrupts him because he becomes worshiping the gold and right. all of the wealth. And it's the worship of money that's evil, not having money. Yeah. You know, I went to, you know, I was raised in a, in a Catholic household. I was, a, I was an altar boy. You know, uh, I've been, you know, I studied somewhat religion. I never remember reading that. I'm currently, you know, a, a practitioner of the Course in Miracles. Right. I read that every single day. Nowhere in there have I ever read that having money is a bad thing. Being successful is a bad thing. It's the worship of money and putting that before others that I would argue is not the right choice. So a misinterpretation that's kind of led yeah. to that belief. Yeah, I truly believe if I live a life of love for all of my fellow people, you know, brothers, if you will, on this sure. planet, which yeah. is hard to do. It's hard to wake up every day and just love everybody. Yeah. But really, if I do that, that's my access to the life that I want to have, first and foremost. So gotcha. I put that into practice every day. I do my best to, you know, not judge others. And I do it. I mean, I'm just human like everybody else. Sure. It's really a question of how quickly I can get off of that cycle, though, right? And there's a lot of training I do to make sure I'm not living what, like that. What kind of training do you do? So I, I practice by reading The Course in Miracles uh, every day. I'm in a group called Being Man uh, with uh, six other men in our group. There's eight groups in total that are about five to six men. 
Every morning we make an I am statement to each other of who we're being for the day. And then we every all, morning, every morning. So on, how do you do that? Uh, Skype? Through Slack. We actually Slack. Have, we have it set up on Slack. So gotcha. through Slack every morning we say, you know, I am today. I am this, whatever, hmm. whatever it is for that day. And then we acknowledge each other as yes, you are. We awesome. support you. Like I, if you say that's who you are, I'm all for it. Like I'm, I'm your partner. Like when, when a client comes in and says, Hey, I'm going to start a business and I'm going to make a million dollars in the next five years. I'm like, yes, you are. Nice. I'm not like, no, you're not. There's so many roadblock, blah, blah, blah. It's great to put that uh, belief or idea out there and then have it confirmed by somebody else right away. Man, I want, like, I want you to make a million dollars in the next five years and, right. and fulfill on all the things that are really important to you. I think that's fantastic. Awesome. Right. So that's kind of how I live my life. And I believe if I live that way, then, you know, the world is, I will have heaven on earth, if you will. Amazing. Right. To quote Marianne Williams. Very cool. So. What are some uh, resources you can turn to people to uh, and uh, just to get their finances in line, like books, uh, podcasts, anything you can think of? Uh, OK, that's the well, first of all, I'd say watch the big short. Yeah. If you don't want to read the book, watch the movie The Big Short because it will actually educate you on a great level of how money is really played at the big level. Gotcha. Right? It's a big game out there and, you know, the entire investment industry is really designed to try to get the money out of your pocket into theirs. Just like anything, you know, you go anywhere in the world, people are trying to sell you something. Right. Right? So that they can get the money. So I would start with that because it really will give you an understanding of how 2008 happened. Um, the the movie you quoted earlier, the Matt Damon. Oh, Inside Job. Inside Job. Also another great movie on understanding on, yeah. on understanding kind of what happened in 2008 and how, you know, if you look at America and Canada, they're very different on how they treat mortgages. Up here, you owe the money no matter what. In America, you can hand back the keys and walk away, hmm. right? So we have some differences. Uh, if you want to start to get technical, I would say that the intelligent investor, Benjamin Graham, which was the the book that schooled Warren Buffett, who worked for Benjamin Graham, but that starts to get a little more into stock technical, you know, stuff and, and a little more jargon. And so sure. if, if you're into taking that on, that's a great read on how to understand value investing. Very cool. Right. All right. Uh, just a few more questions before yep. I wrap it up here. And uh one of them is if uh, if you could make a phone call to your twenty year old self and uh, give them one piece of advice, what would that be? Wow. So uh, my gut, my first gut reaction would be do the landmark form. Hmm. Interesting. It taught me so much about who I am as a human being and what my natural state as a human is. The best self-development work I've ever done, and it was the first thing I really did, and it just opened up my eyes to how I operate. Wow. So okay. if I could do that over again, I, that's the first thing I would do. Well, that's definitely a very popular course in the city. A lot of people have gone and done that one. Yeah. So, Okay, awesome advice. And the last question I have for you, this is kind of a – be creative as you want with this answer. And that is, uh, if you could like wave a magic wand and change one thing about the world that you could, that you wanted to, anything at all, mm -hmm. what would that be and why? I would eliminate fear because I believe that fear is the driver that puts people into attack mode that has them do the things to other human beings that they if they weren't in a place of fear, they wouldn't want to do. And so, you know, I believe that uh, we can all live in a beautiful state, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, the opposite of love is fear. So I would get rid of fear so that we have more love, if right. you would. I mean, yeah, it's so true, right? If people are operating out of, out of fear, a lot of times that causes us to act badly and do things that we normally wouldn't do, you know. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. Great answer. So. All right. Awesome. Well, is there anything else you'd like to get out there today? Um, I would like to acknowledge you two for the work that you're doing. I've watched some of your podcasts. I, I think your shop here is fantastic. Um, Thank you. My next trip back to Vancouver, I live in Nanaimo for those that, that don't know me. And uh, I travel to, the, to our office here in Kitsilano every three weeks and work with our team here. But my next trip in, I'm definitely booking 
uh, afloat because I've never done one and I've cool. wanted to. Yeah. But I think the work you guys are doing here is is amazing. And I, Thank you. I and I know what it takes. I, I do some podcasting as well. I know what it takes, the energy that you have to put in to to be a vehicle for your guests to have success. Absolutely. And so I want to thank the both of you for giving me the opportunity to share what I do and for just doing what you guys do. I think it's awesome. Well, thank it's totally you. reciprocal. Like yeah. it wouldn't happen if you weren't here too. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. And yeah, floating is a, it's an amazing practice for people to take on. I, I personally like to use it at least once a week. And I find by doing that, I really stay on top of my stress levels. Um, I'm just functioning better. You know, if you have a bad night of sleep one night, you can go for a float. You feel great the rest of the day. Um, it really helps with the immune system, all sorts of great things with that. And also, awesome. there's also the whole self-awareness piece too, right? It's like when you start getting really alone with your thoughts and you start seeing what's bubbling up for you, Yeah, you know, really start taking note of those things, especially if they're somewhat triggering, especially if there's something that repeatedly comes up for you over and over. That's something that you might want to address in your life. Yeah. But that's the whole other side of it, as well as the meditation. So, yeah. Um, yeah, awesome. Well, Thomas, thank you very much for joining us on Vancouver Real. This was an awesome episode. Tons of value here. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Thomas's book, Bloom, Your Money, Your Life. Definitely, where can they get this? So, so here's, the, uh, here's the plug for the book. It's on Amazon.ca, the ebook. It's yeah. $7.96. All proceeds go to Backpack Buddies, which is a local charity that feeds kids over the weekend when they're not in school on their hunger program at school or their food program at school. So we have a lot of kids that are in underprivileged areas of this city that they go to school during the week, they get meals at school, they go home on the weekend, and they might not eat for the entire weekend. Wow. So Backpack Buddies organizes wow. schools that have to put the backpacks together, and then they bring them over to the schools where kids might not have and send the kids home for the weekend with a backpack where they'll eat over the weekend. So all proceeds from the, I'm not in this, the business of selling books, all proceeds from that, the sale of that book, go to Backpack Buddies and to support hungry kids. So. That's incredible, awesome. amazing, w great way to give back. You're giving people a very useful resource. I know this is in the back there, there's all sorts of, um, like just basically getting your personal finances straightened out and like writing things down and figuring out where you are and then moving forward from it's there. It's a workbook so, too then. Yeah, my, yeah, wife, my wife was like, hey, you should design it as a workbook. And I was yeah. like, man, you're, totally. a, you're such a genius. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm really looking forward to going through it. I'll, I'll definitely do that later this week. So thank you very much for the book. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, as always, guys, if uh, you liked what you heard today, head on over to our Facebook page and give us a like and a review and a share. Uh, and, you know, reviews and ratings on iTunes are also extremely helpful to help us get found. There's something like a million podcasts out there right now. So that's a big sea of podcasts to be found in. Yep. Luckily, we're being found. You know, we're getting bigger and bigger guests all the time. And we're kind of climbing that pad podcast guest hierarchy, if you will. Yeah. Um, and we're going to continue doing that. We don't plan on stopping. So yep. uh, thank you very much for support. Really appreciate you. Come out to the meetups. Uh, we have them at least once a month. And we have three things going on this this month. We have the Philip McKernan screening of Give and Grow. We have, um, sorry, we have the Mindful Mass Meditation on the 20th. And then on 21st, Wim Hof. Come have a full Wim Hof experience. Oh, and I forgot to mention after that, Casper, Wim Hof's top trainer, is coming to Vancouver for a full weekend immersion of the Wim Hof method, which will include the breath work, you know, cold water immersion, exercises, and a hike in the snow in just a pair of shorts. So that will be wild. Awesome. So, can, can I give one more quick plug? 100%. Tomorrow night um, at the Brick Studio down here in this area, we're having a B Corp presentation on how an entrepreneur can start a B corporation or turn their company into a B mm. certified corporation. Cool. So we do very a, challenging process. Yeah, we do. We do an event once a month. So tomorrow we're, and, uh, I can't remember the name of the brewery. Uh, they're going to be down. Uh, they're a B corporation. Where is it? The brewery, which uh, one here in Vancouver starts with PH. Fis Oh man, I can't. Remember. If you named it, I probably know exactly yeah, where I'm it sorry. is. Yeah, sorry, I don't. I don't drink, so. Oh, that's terrible, okay. What a terrible plug. But anyhow, <laughs> for, for, you know, they're you, going there. Yeah, so. you, you come where can, down, they, can they find you on Facebook? Or yeah, anything so like that, go the to event? Bloom Strategies on Facebook. The the um, the invite is there, and uh, yeah, so learn about being a B Corp. They're a B Corp, and they're going to be giving out samples of their beer. So that's tomorrow night at six thirty. Uh, down at the Brick Studio. Amazing. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Cool, Mike. Anything else you want to add there? Nope. Just happy birthday. To float house. To float yeah, house. Yeah, happy birthday, guys. Yeah. That's fantastic. Four yeah. years. Yeah, Is it four cool. years today? Four, four years, years today. Hey, look yeah. at man, I get yeah. like the four year. And you totally. Know, I didn't even know until Mike texted me today. I'm like, I'm like, holy crap, it's our four year. But do, uh, do you guys do numerology at all? Your, you know, do you know your number? Um, your life number, your life path. Yeah, mine's a, mine's a one. I'm a nine. Right, mine's four. Okay. Okay. So what does four mean? 
I, I, I don't know. I'd have to read it again. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember. But I like yeah. one. Ones are pretty badass. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. happy with my one. I think that all they're day. They're all badass, man. Come on. They're all great human beings. <laughs> what do you mean? Not, but Bobby Orr wore number four. Oh, and he was my okay. favorite well, hockey that, player. That's so, a whole new level anyhow, of badass. Yeah. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, and uh, yeah. until next time. To whatever is. To whatever.